Well, welcome everybody. Hey, by the way, thank you so much for those of you that are participating in our building campaign. We want, want everyone to be a part of the legacy tiles in our walk of faith. And if you'd like to know more information, just outside that door, there's a table that you can get more information on. It'll be a few years we're going to be in this campaign until everything is built. So everyone jump in, participate. Thank you so much for doing so. And speaking of building campaigns, I heard a funny story of a pastor trying to do a building campaign in a small little country church. And so he issued a challenge. So he said this, he said, the first one to pledge $100 to our building campaign can choose the next three hymns. Well, all of a sudden, one of the elderly ladies stood up in the back. She said, I'll do it. He said, well, thank you for your pledge, sister. And the pastor said, what, what three hymns do you choose? She said, I choose him and him and him. <laughs> so building campaigns are more than what meets the eye. Today we want to talk about regaining your joy. Regaining your joy. So I want you to take out your Bibles and you have a blank sheet of paper there for some notes. I'm going to give you two points that I want you to... Uh, pick up on and I want to say welcome to those of you that are streaming via the internet my wife is going uh, by internet so honey I love you <laughs> <laughs> regaining our joy we all have difficulties in life I mean you there's a co-worker at uh, the office that's giving you some problems maybe an insensitive person in school you run up against people that are always uh, down on everything. Or you face neurotic drivers on H1. <laughs> Just like a few weeks ago, this car pulled right up next to me. It's like it's about ready to scrape the side of my car. And I wasn't even noticing it. I was just paying attention to myself in, the dry, in my lane. And all of a sudden, he beeps his horn. And you know, when they startle you like that, you get mad. I, oh, what do you do that for? And the guy sped off. And it wasn't until he went by me that I noticed a New Hope bumper sticker. <laughs> but it wasn't our campus. It was Manoa. <laughs> And I looked again, it was Pastor Rogers laughing. <laughs> Others that make, might steal your joy might be people in your own family. Those that are hard to get along with and they just give you stress. It's so easy to become negative in life and discouraged. But I want you to know that God did not design us to live that way. God did not design you to just have to tolerate your family, put up with your spouse, endure your job. No. Now, the scripture says, now the thief comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. But watch this. God says that I have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Did you know that you were actually designed to enjoy life? That's what he designed. Uh, you won't always because circumstance, you can't control circumstances, but he designed us to be able to control what's going on here so that we are not a victim to circumstances. He actually created us in such a way that we were to enjoy life. So right now at this juncture, let me make a very clear distinction between happiness and joy. You need to know the difference because sometimes we just want to be happy. But happiness comes from that word happening, happenstances. It comes from the outside in. When the happenings are good, we are happy. When the happenings or the happenstances aren't good, we're not happy. But we're waiting for the outside in, whereas joy is not outside in. Joy is inside out that's why the book of James says consider it all joy my brethren when you encounter various trials knowing that the testing of your faith will produce endurance so we're not waiting for these things to give us joy or happiness we bring it with us it comes from the inside if the happenstances are good then we're happy 
The, the, no traffic on the way to work. I'm happy. My boss is treating me better. I'm happy. My wife still thinks I'm awesome. I'm happy. In fact, my, I do. I have a wife that still thinks I'm awesome. Yeah, you know, I, I just turned 63 years old a few weeks ago. Yeah, don't clap. And, uh, and so I was standing in front of the mirror, and I was looking at myself, and I thought, oh, man, what happened to me? Because the things that just have begun to sag has increased in velocity going southward. And it's just everything is starting to sag. And just then, my wife comes in the bathroom. So I see her. Oh, and you know how you suck in your stomach? <laughs> But, but then after a while, I, oh, this is tiring. Oh, oh. So it came back out. And, uh, and so I looked at my wife and I said, honey, look at this guy in the mirror. I said, will you still love me when I'm old and fat and wrinkled? She looked at me in the mirror and she said, honey, I do. <laughs> Isn't she sweet? She's just the sweetest lady. I thought, oh, I'll go marry you all over again. But you see, joy can leak, and it can leak in just a moment. It's gone if you're not careful. So how do you regain your joy? I want to tell you not only how to regain your joy, but how eternally or spiritually important it is for you to maintain that. Nehemiah, in the book of Nehemiah chapter 8, as we conclude this time and series together, I want you to see that he gives us the ingredients to this recipe. He speaks to the people in the first part. In fact, let's read it together, Nehemiah 8.10, and let's uh, read it with our best thespian voices. Are you ready? Go. Nehemiah said, Go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks and send some to those who have nothing prepared. Stop right there. He'd, he'd been reading the Bible. And our Ezra has been preaching, and, and the people, some of them were crying. Why? Because God's word was convicting them. But he says, oh, no, 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 don't cry. God's going to give you sweet drink and food. Why? So that you can share with those who have nothing. I want you to remember this. God will fill you up in order for you to fulfill your purpose. God will fill you up in order for you to fulfill your purpose. On the ranch, we have a, have a family ranch in Oregon, and uh, we have different you know, things like tractors and different things. And, and I have a, it's a canister or a, a air compressor tank that's about a 20-gallon tank, and it doesn't have a compressor attached to it. It's a portable thing where you hook it to another compressor, and it compresses the air in just this tank. It's an aluminum tank. And psh! You just hold it until it gets to about 150, 170 pounds of pressure. And then you unhook it, and it's very light because it's just air. And you can carry it out to the remotest part of the farm and, and fill up tires or think, something that's low in air. And you just kind of psh, psh. And it's just a portable thing. But you'll notice that the compressed compressed air goes from 160 to 130 to 120 the more you use it and then it gets down to 30 pounds and, and you've got to go back and refill it so that you can continue what, it ne what needs to be done because you can't get these vehicles or farm machinery because it's got a flat tire or whatever to the compressor so you just go out and psh, fill all of these up and I was thinking about that that's sort of like us God is going to have you as you go to work this week or you go to school or even in your family. There's people that are going to be deflated, people that will be defeated and discouraged and distressed. And God's going to fill us up at times just like this so that we can go out and psh, fill that person with inspiration, with encouragement, with a blessing, with a good word. But you see, if we're defeated and we're deflated, we have nothing to give. So God's going to fill us up. No, we're not dependent on circumstances. He says, I want to fill you up. Why? Because there's a purpose to fulfill. I will fill you in order for you to fulfill what I've called you to do, which is you're going to be people that will be a part of the healing of the nations. That's what the church is. So I'm going to fill you up. So Nehemiah said this. He said, go and enjoy choice food and sweet drink and send some to those who have nothing prepared. Continue with me, go. 
This day is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your... Yeah, the joy of the Lord is your... It, what does it give you? And where does that joy come from? The... Not from circumstances, from the... Yeah, you have to understand, joy is different from happiness. Joy doesn't make you giddy. It may not even necessarily make you happy. The joy is from the Lord, and it will give you strength. Sometimes we just want happy. Happy, give me more happy. And we pray, God, give me happy, until the point where we in America, we are addicted to entertainment. We're being entertained into a coma. I mean, even little kids are just being entertained. And so they grow up, and they don't know the difference between happiness and joy because they think this is all there is. And then so pretty soon, we just want, like, chicken skin. You know, show me that YouTube again. Ooh, that, oh, that chicken skin. Ooh, give me some more. What's that? Ooh, chicken. Ooh, chicken skin. Ooh, chicken skin. Ooh, look that, look that. Ooh, chicken skin, chicken skin. If you keep getting chicken skin, the only thing it's going to do is make you look like a chicken. That's it. It's not sustainable. There has to be something to sustain you. <laughs> this is funny. You got time for a story? This is a funny one. There's, this guy went to the psychiatrist and he said, Doctor, doctor, my brother thinks he's a chicken. I mean, he goes around the house all day long, cluck, 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 like a hen. And the doctor said, oh, I've seen this problem before. In fact, I am known for one who can cure people of this problem in one session. He said, I know, doctor, that's why I came to you. He said, you knew that? So why didn't you bring in your brother sooner? He said, I would have, doctor, but we really needed the eggs. <laughs> that's all I got, so you better give me more than that. God bless you, God bless you. Thank you, God bless you, God bless you. So how do we do this? How do we regain our joy? Let me give you two ways. And the first is, it's going to be pretty obvious. But would you write down, refill often. <laughs> See, the more life taxes you, the more you have to refill. Refill often because he's going to put us in the midst of a crooked and a perverse generation among whom we must appear as lights in the world to inspire and encourage and help. And so we've got to refill often, especially in these days. In fact, Ephesians says this in 5.19. It says this. Would you read it with me? Go. Be filled with the Spirit. Pause right there. And again, the Greek doesn't mean just once. Be ye being filled with the Spirit of God. Do not be drunk with wine. In other words, don't try to get artificial external things to sustain you. Don't be drunk with wine wherein it is excess. But instead, be ye filled with the Spirit inside out. Well, how do I do that? We start here. Read it. Go. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, making melody in your hearts to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of the Lord. Now, I want you to catch that. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. There's an inner conversation that's going on right now in all of your heads. And you have to manage that because it can go negative very quickly. In fact, we as humans have a tendency more towards the negative inner conversation than the positive. But that inner conversation is important. And we need to be refilled often. And one of the ways is you speak to yourself in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and make melody in your heart. And you'll have to refill again and again. It's like a helium balloon. Have you ever gotten a helium balloon at your birthday? Yeah, the first day is like, man, it's just filled with just levity and just, woo, if you let it go, it just goes to Pluto. The second day, woo, man, it might go to the top of the tree in front of your house. By the third day, it's sort of limping along. It's got, got a broken leg. By the fourth or fifth day, it's laying down in a coma. And by the eighth day, it's passed away. <laughs> but was there something wrong with the balloon? No, it just leaks. So the Bible says you have to be constantly refilled with the Holy Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, making melody in your heart to the Lord. So, well, how do we leak? 
I'll give you, here's the biggest cause where our joy leaks out. Are you ready? Complaining. The human tendency is towards complaint and negativity. And each time we complain or we bellyache or we whine or wheeze, it causes our joy to leak out. Because you cannot have the joy of the Lord and be a complainer. You cannot be a cynic and have the, you have to choose one or the other. And it's so easy for us to just start complaining and whining and belly aching because it's so easy to get on the bigger, uh, the, the negative side. We, we complain about everything. We complain if God won't answer our prayers and we complain if he does. I mean, think about it. We pray, oh God, give me a bigger house after he does. Look how much I got to clean. You know how much of work I have to do around this place. None of you respect me at all. You know how much I work around here. <laughs> oh, God, I pray that you'll bring people to our church. We come next Sunday. I can't even get a parking space around here. It's crazy. I'm not going to come to this church no more. I'm tired of this. Isn't that right? We complain if God doesn't answer our prayer, and then we complain if he does. Oh, God, give me a wife. And then he does. Then you got to work, you complain because you got to work three jobs to just afford that woman. <laughs> yeah, I said that in the second, uh, the uh, first service this morning. You know, you got to work three jobs to afford this woman. One guy raised his hand. That's me. That's me. <laughs> we, we all started just cracking up. I had to dismiss service. That was done. We were... But we complain. We always, there's like something to complain about. No parking, or, or if there is, it's too far away. I didn't like where the usher seated me. I should have been seated someplace more better than that. You know how much I give? Five dollars. Five dollars. I mean. <laughs> we just complain and complain and complain. I didn't get anything out of that sermon. You know, we can complain about sermons about complaining. Well, how do you refill? Because that happens. Well, he says, speak to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Make melody in your heart. You see, we do have inner conversations, don't we? Isn't that right? Some of you, I know you, you have way too much inner conversation. But How many of you talk to yourselves? Raise your hand. Come on, yeah. yeah. How many of you argue with yourselves? Raise your hand. Yeah. How many of you lose the arguments? psychiatrists for you <laughs> but there are there's that inner conversation but you control the conversation how many of us have such negative talk on the inside I can't do that if she's gonna say that I'm out of here if this is how it is I'm don't don't expect me to come back what's this why are you saying that that's stupid and he's just like you're just criticizing complaining on the inside and I bet it's gonna come outside sooner or later because you're so full of complaints on the inside, there's a cavity in your soul, and it's drawing in like a vacuum, the dust of the world. It will toxify you. It's like microbacteria that just grows on the inside because it's so easy to just have negative, in, negative conversation. Can I encourage you for this next season uh, to, to have a different conversation on the inside? Instead of negative, send your words in the direction you want your life to go. I mean, send your words that way, like, I can do this. God is good. God is, has chosen me. John 15, 16, you didn't choose me, I chose you, says the Lord, and appointed you that you should go forth and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. So God wants me to be successful. I know that he has plans for me. I'm a child of God. No weapon formed against me shall prosper because he's got plans for me and I know that he holds my future and I'm excited to walk into it. So God, here we go because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Let's get moving. And all of a sudden your spirit goes, whoa! We're ready. Something takes place on the inside. You steer the inner conversation. That's exactly what the scripture says. Otherwise, we defeat ourselves. You say, where, where, where do you start? 
Start with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. I would encourage you to learn a couple of hymns. And when you, your mind starts to go, just start singing the hymn in your heart. Yeah. Great is thy faithfulness. Yeah, but things aren't going. Great is thy faithfulness. My paycheck was like, Grow morning by morning, new mercies I see. Yeah, but there's nothing in your cup. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness. There's, there's this funny story. This lady, my head just goes to these things, so I'm sorry. But this lady, she, she doesn't have anything in her cupboards, and she learned that hymn. So she'd come out in the morning, great is thy faithfulness. Thank you for providing morning by morning new mercy. And the, her neighbor's an atheist. He said, shut up. All I have needed thy hands. Thank you for providing. Um, your hand hath provided. The guy goes, shut up. It's in the morning. Well, the next morning she comes out, thank you, God, for providing all I have needed. Your hands have provided. And this guy's saying, shut up. God's not going to provide nothing for you because there's no God. Great is thy faithfulness. Oh, he's so mad. So before she comes out the third morning, he said, I'm going to trick her because she needs to know that there's no God. God doesn't provide anything. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to provide it for her, and I'm going to let her know because God doesn't provide. I do. And so he goes to the grocery store, fills up some groceries, and puts the sack on her porch before she comes out in the morning. Well, she comes out, great is thy faithfulness. Thank you for providing. God, you did. You provided for me. Great is your faithfulness. And the guy jumps out from behind the bushes. No, God didn't provide nothing. I was the one that brought that. I put that there. Ah, I fooled you. She said, Lord, thank you for providing. And not only did you provide for me, you had the devil deliver it. <laughs> Count your blessings. He said, well, Wayne, really, though, uh, uh, things aren't going that good in my life. Where do I start? Here, here it is. I ask myself this question, and I keep it in the forefront of my mind. It's helped me for years. And here, and I actually will put it up. What, would you, what if you got up tomorrow morning, and the only things you had left were the things you thanked God for yesterday? What if you got up tomorrow morning, and the only things you had left were the things you thanked God for the day before? You know, I think a lot of us wouldn't have much. All that does is it shows us that we're not a real thankful people. And we have to train our hearts in thankfulness. How many of you would agree? Yeah, we have to train our hearts in thankfulness. So I ask myself, Wayne, what do you want tomorrow to be around? And so I start there. I want my wife to be there. I want my family to be there. So I thank God for my wife. Thank God for my kids most of the time. Thank God for my grandkids. Thank God for this church. Thank God for our, where we live. Thank God that you, you give us friends. And so I just start thanking him for all the things that I want around tomorrow. Because that question keeps coming at me. What if you got up in the morning? And the only things you have left are the things you thanked God for the day before. So what do you want remaining when all else is gone? Because we're so prone to complaining. And each time you complain, it's like leaking joy. And it starts to develop a toxic buildup. Well, how do you get rid of that? Well, one is you stop this, and then you have to backfill thankfulness. Romans 12 says, don't be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. In other words, you can stop this, which we're going to talk about in just a second, but you have to start depositing into your heart bank account thankfulness and gratefulness so that you build up a supply of thankfulness. Otherwise, we'll have a supply of gripes and complaints and belly aches. 
And so when someone says something, blah, and then we've just, because we got a, a huge account of belly aching. But if you just dry that up and start to increase your bank supply of thankfulness, then when something pokes you and demands a complaint, you say, you know, I have no supply of complaint, but I got a lot of gratefulness. I got a lot. I built that up. So here's your homework. Until Christmas, until Christmas, at least, let's do this. Let's put a moratorium on complaining. Let's fast belly aching. Let's put a strike on whining. Let's just stop all our gripes and wheezing. And let's just put a moratorium. Let's, ju let's just stop that. Let's just boycott complaining. What do you think? Wouldn't that be good? Just That'll be the best Christmas gift. That'll be the best Christmas gift you can give to yourself and your family. Isn't that right? And I promise you, you watch your relationship just start to increase. But a lot of us are addicted to complaining, so it has to be something done intentionally. Well, what if I'm just always surrounded by complainers? Uh, what you do is you just refuse to participate in it. And if you start and you realize, oops, just stop. Just stop complaining and stop participating in it. So if you're around a coworker and they're complaining about this and complaining about that, just, oh, okay, and then just move away. Sometimes physically, get out of there. So, oh, yeah, okay, I, I got to do an errand, so I'll catch you later, or I got to go shishi, anything. Just get out of there <laughs> and get away from it, and don't participate in it. Don't. Don't get belligerent. You know, well, I'm a Christian. Shut up. Don't be doing that around me. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> or you can still use religious words, and you're griping. So just don't participate in it. And so we're going to boycott complaining. Everybody good with that? In fact, my wife and I, it became so important to us that we put some signs together in our house, and you can check it out, and it, it says, never is heard a discouraging word. And we put that around to remind us, no. Because we were in a season where we were just hearing all these complaints about this, complaints about this, complaints about this. It's so, enough. <laughs> just don't want to hear that anymore. You can solve it, but don't gripe about it. Yeah. And if you don't want to solve it, forget about talking negative. So no, no more to be heard a discouraging word. That's it. And I said to my wife, honey, we're getting a little older. And I, you know, I've seen old biddies and they gripe about everything. They're opinionated. They're, they make snide remarks. I said, in our house, no biddies allowed. <laughs> None. And so let's be a people that have a boycott on complaining. And let's try it. That'd be a great Christmas gift. Amen? So we're going to start that. So we're going to try that. And uh, we're just not going to complain. So you say, but Wayne, what, what if I'm going through some hard times and it's all like bad stuff? Or just find something to be thankful for. You remember in the scripture, it says, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, making melody in your hearts unto the Lord. And it says what? And be thankful for all things. Give thanks for all things unto the Lord. Give thanks for all things. What do you mean? Give thanks for what? Find something to be thankful for. Why? Because you have to build your bank account. So I don't care. Just thank God. Thank God for something. When you're brushing your teeth, thank God. Just... Lord, thank you, I got teeth. <laughs> Combing your hair, thank you, Lord, I have hair. And if you don't have hair, thank you, Lord, I don't have to spend time combing hair that I don't have. <laughs> thank you, Lord, I don't have hair. Because when people itch, have itchy heads, they don't get to their head. They have to scratch their hair on top of their head. Me, when I have an itchy head, I go straight to my scalp, no middleman. <laughs> That's it. Find something. You look in the mirror. Oh, my. Don't look at that. Look at the mirror. Thank God for the mirror. <laughs> Don't look at the creature. Just look at the mirror. <laughs> yeah, coming to church today. Thank God uh, for this windshield. How many of you are grateful you have a windshield? If not... <laughs> Thank God for the windshield wipers. If you didn't have a windshield, you wouldn't need wipers. 
And it sounds humorous, but really find something to be thankful for. Because if not, you're going to get negative about something. What a rain. Oh, look at that guy splash my car. I went by, shh. What is this? <laughs> right? We're prone to the negative side. So what we need to do is start to find stuff to thank God for and just do it. Why? Because I've got, a bil I've got a lot, a lot to build. I have an empty account. I've got to thank God for all things. That's why in another portion it says, in everything give thanks for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. Was he saying everything was going to be happy? No, just for all things give thanks. Why? Because your bank account is low in gratefulness. And when someone pokes you, it's going to come toxic. Why? Because that's all you have. You have to stop, put a moratorium on that, boycott complaining, and build your account in gratefulness. So when someone does poke you, you say, you know, I just don't have any supply of negativity, but I got a lot of thankfulness. Why? Because I deposited a bunch. That's what he's saying. And then you'll see the joy of the Lord just coming to you. Because the joy of the Lord is your strength. And write down number two. You say, well, Wayne, why is it so important? I'll tell you why it's so important. You have to realize the power of joy. I need you to listen really careful for the next five minutes because this is going to be very important. You have to realize the power of joy. Because he says the joy of the Lord is your... Yeah, there's a power to joy. It's in Psalm 51, verse 10 right at the beginning of verse 11 as well. David prays a powerful prayer. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Because if you have a negative spirit, you're going to feel far from God. That's why he says, cast me not away from thy presence. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. And then he says this, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation what why do you think he prayed restore unto me the joy of thy salvation because sometimes it needs restoring now here's what you need to listen to one of the greatest treasures and most valuable treasures you have is your joy your joy quotient and when the devil who comes to steal kill and to destroy when he comes to steal something he always looks for treasure now listen carefully your treasure is the, is the joy in your heart, and he wants to steal that. Why? The devil can't steal your salvation, for example. That's wrapped up in the blood of Christ, and that's based on his performance on Calvary, not yours on the earth. So he can't steal your salvation. So you know what he's going to do? He's going to steal the joy of your salvation, and you'll give up on it yourself. He's going to steal the joy of being a Christian. Oh, why should I do this? Why should I be a Christian? I was happier before. He's going to steal the joy of your salvation, the joy of being a Christian. You'll disqualify yourself. Watch carefully. Because, see, the devil has no authority to disqualify you. The only two people that have is God and yourself. God's not going to, and you could. You can bail out. You can refuse and reject. You can backslide. Isn't that right? You can make rationalizations. You can get mad at God and go the other way like Jonah did when God said to go to Nineveh. He went the other way to Tarshish. That's our choice. And listen, the devil cannot destroy you, but he can put you to such a place where you do it yourself. How, do he, how does he do that? He steals your joy. For example, he cannot steal your ministry. So you know what he'll do? He'll steal the joy of your ministry and you'll opt out of it yourself. He can't steal your marriage. Nope. But he'll steal the joy of being married so it's no longer a joy. And you'll look for a way out yourself. He can't steal the fact that you're a dad, but he can steal the joy of being a dad and you don't do anything in that role. He can't steal the fact that you're a mom, but he'll steal the joy of you being a mom and you don't perform at all for your kids. You're just like, I'm absent. You understand? 
Joy is a thing he's going to go for. It is his greatest treasure because once he steals that, you disqualify yourself. Do you understand how insidious he is? Because he comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. That's why maintaining your joy is so incredibly important because that's his target. So when I speak about regaining joy, it's not just some nice giddy nice words for a sermon. No, no, no. There is a power in joy. By the way, I, I've studied some Greek and past and Bible college and stuff. And, and, and you know what the word, when someone is called charismatic, it's actually a Greek word, charisma. And charisma means gifts, gifts of grace. Charis is a word for grace. And maton is the suffix, and it talks about the gifts of grace. Now, charis is a word for grace. But you know what the root word of that is? Car, C-H-A-R. Charis is grace. Charisma means a person that's gifted with God's grace. And he's very, you know, jubilant or he's got the X factor, whatever it might be. But charis is grace. But the root of that, C-H-A-R, you know what that is? Car is a word for joy. Interesting, isn't it? But you steal the joy, and it doesn't matter what gifts you have. You steal the joy, and it doesn't matter how popular you are. You steal the joy, and even if God has given you great influence, all of that gets disqualified because the root is gone. To protect your joy is incredibly important. We talk about people serving around here, but serving isn't really what we want you to do. You say, Ooh, we just had the Nehemiah wall, and I signed up. We just saw a video on that, bro. Yeah, but that's, see, we can hire people to do that stuff, to serve. No, it's, it's not serving. It's the heart with which we serve that'll make all the difference in the world. Isn't that right? Have you gone to places where they, like, you go to a restaurant, they don't really want to serve you, like, you're a bother? Yeah, it's like, I don't want to be here. But you go to other places and they go, of course, can you be seated? Of course. Where would you like to sit? Oh, wow, I get a choice. Yes, absolutely. This is your day. Whoa, okay, I want to sit there. Sure. Can I have a napkin? Oh, absolutely. Of course you want. Well, how many do you want? And I was like, man, I'm coming back to this restaurant. Yeah. You go to a church and if ushers are there genuinely glad to see you, it's like, this is cool. Have you ever gone to a church where the ushers like don't give a rip? They kind of put their hand out like a dead ahi. You know. <laughs> Hi, I'm Wayne. Who cares? I mean, where do you want me to sit? Who cares? Whatever. <laughs> it's like, I don't want to be there. You know, New Hope is known as a people that will hug everything within 10 feet of them. <laughs> And I love our servants because they serve with joy. I watch the people put up tents and set up out here. And, man, they do it with joy. I just love to see them. I, I watch these people over here setting up for church, and man, they just do it with great joy. That's what's attractive. It's not servants. It's people who serve with joy. And if you don't serve with joy, here's what God says, don't serve. What? Yeah. See, one of the most interesting verses is, is Deuteronomy 28 and verse 47. And it's going to come up on the board, and it says this. It puts it in the negative, but it says this. Because you did not serve the Lord your God with joyfulness and gladness of heart for the abundance of all things, here's the result. Therefore, what? You will serve your enemies. It's like he said, the enemy is going to come in like a flood if you think it's just God wants your service. No, he wants your heart. And here is a means to that happening. Come and serve. And then your heart becomes expressed. And then I begin to fill you afresh. Because you did not serve the Lord, stop. No, because you didn't serve the Lord with what? With a joyful and a glad heart. Therefore, the enemy takes advantage. Is there a power to joy? Absolutely. You know what it does? It keeps the enemy at bay. So you throw your heart into it. And you begin to serve with joy. Oh, when that happens. It's so precious when you're serving with joy. I love that. I love it when people kind of bring their joy with them, you know. If you're waiting to be happy and chicken skin, then you're waiting for someone to deliver it. 
But when you understand the joy of the Lord, which becomes strength, you bring it with you because you've developed that. You put a moratorium on complaining. You stocked up on your thankfulness and you give that to God and you find stuff to be grateful for and you start singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, making melody in your heart. And everywhere you go, you have a load of inspiration and encouragement to give away and it doesn't run dry because you're constantly being refilled. Let me finish with a story that uh, is absolutely true. When I started in Hilo, I was just 31 years old. That was eight and a half years ago. And uh, I... Uh, <laughs> just a young pastor and and we thought we would start a softball league so we invited a bunch of churches that we just you know looked them up on the yellow pages and we had yellow pages back then and and so we just called these churches up to be a part of this league and we called up a bunch and some said yes so it was great and uh, <clears throat> I'm I, I love softball I'm not competitive at all I'm just like either you know whatever no problem but we all had uniforms, we had mitts, we oiled the mitts, had cleats, we had bats, and we practiced double dailies until the season started. And uh, because I wanted to make sure that we win, I was the pitcher. And, uh, just, but I'm not very competitive. But anyway, this is the first game. The first game, we were playing this team, and it was a Tongan church, a Tongan church. Now. They come in this van. It's a rickety old van. You can hear them three blocks away. And they come and these uh, Tongans spill out. Now, they must have been right fresh off the boat. <laughs> because some had never played softball before. But they wanted to be a part of this church fellowship thing because it was a pretty new church. And so these Tongans come out of the van and they have no shoes, no gloves, no mitts, no bat. They just came. <laughs> and so, you know, we we're all decked out with our hats. We had special hats and everything. We're waiting for them. And they just come out like, what is this? <laughs> and they're just laughing. <laughs> and so we let them go bat first, you know. And so they get up to bat. They have no bats. So I thought, oh, man, give them that, that crooked one. Give them that crooked so, so they get this bat, and the first guy comes up to bat. He, I don't think he's ever played softball before. So the first guy comes up to bat, and here's the home plate. And you're supposed to stand, like, on the side of it. He stands on top of it, and he's like this, and he's wiggling himself like he's Michael Jackson or something, you know. And, and so I say, you need to get off that base because I'll bean you if otherwise because it's going to go straight over. So, and just then, all the Tongans come out of the dugout and they start laughing at him. Bah! Get off the base! The guy goes, oh, and he starts laughing. And so I pitch the first one. He misses it by a yard. And I pitch the second one. He misses it again. And by mistake, he hits the third one. And so it dribbles out to me. I'm the pitcher, right? I pick it up. And the only problem is when he hit the ball, he starts running in the direction he's facing. Third base. He starts running to third base. All of them come out of the dugout again. I got the ball. I'm ready to throw it to first, but he's running to third. And if you got the ball and the guy's running to third, how do you get him out? Do you throw it to third or first? And so they're all laughing at him. First, they say, go the other way. So he, goes, oh, <laughs> so he cuts across the infield. I tag him out at the pitcher's mound. <laughs> well, we get these guys out, one, two, three. And then now it's time for them to go out in the field. So no gloves. You know, and we're really a good Christian team because we didn't offer them any of ours. And so... <laughs> They go out into the field, and no position specifically. They just kind of like rover, red rover, send rover right over. They just, they just kind of spread out. And they're, they're just all over the field. And our, the first guy to come up was a guy named Cardi Thomas. And he's a big Hawaiian. And he nails his first pitch out into the outfield. And this Tongan guy is going back, and he trips, and the ball hits him. You can hear it on his chest. Poof! <laughs> And everybody looks at him and they start laughing. <laughs> he gets up and he starts laughing. 
And he throws the ball, not to the infield, to the center fielder. Just throws it out there. Center fielder gets it, throws it back. They start playing catch. And our guys are whoom, running around the bases. Whoom. I watched this the whole game, and I thought, man. I, you know, we beat him terribly. I, I, I don't think even our calculator went that high. I just... But that was so attractive because they didn't wait for the softball game to give them any joy. They brought it with them. And even though we beat them soundly, I learned so much from them because when the game was over, as competitive as I am, when the game was all over, I wanted to join the Tongan team. <laughs> because there's something about joy. You see, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Not how good we play softball. You know, when people come, it's not the lights that attracts them, or we've got such nice stuff, but it's really the joy in the people's hearts, isn't it? When they see the servants serving with joy, it's like, man, I want to come be a part of this. There's something in me that needs that. Oh, it's not happiness. It doesn't come from outside in. It's something that's generated from within, and that's what gives you strength. Then, Mom, you are able to fill and inspire and encourage people, your children, your spouse, dad, your kids, those at the workplace, because it's something on the inside. And when you understand how to regain joy by refilling often, and understanding the power of joy and put a moratorium on complaining and start to stack up your bank account of thankfulness, remembering that what would it be if I got up tomorrow and the only thing I had left was what I thanked God for yesterday. Begin that. Be thankful in all things. Joy begins to resurge within you, and you'll have everything you need in the strength of the Lord to do what he's asked you to do. And when God sees that, then he says, ah, now you know what it means, that the joy of the Lord will be your... Amen? Amen. Let it be.